Morning, sixth grade. Happy Friday. We got math lesson 38. Happy making it to the end of the first week as we start to get rolling on, seeing if we can do this virtual thing live. Hopefully, you got the quiz done on the back side as we start to work on some of these complex area problems uh, and area of triangles that we picked up uh, earlier this week. The answers are, read like this. I added, simplified, one and one third, subtracted one third, multiplied four ninths, divided one. Added and simplified one, subtracted one half, multiplied three sixteenths, divided three. Step more complicated because you got to find common denominators. Those are twelve, uh, six, sorry. Add together, simplified it one and one six, subtracted one six, canceled and got one third. State change flipped and simplified one and one third. Last one, common denominators were twelve. Added and simplified one and five twelfths subtracted one twelfth, multiplied one half, uh, state change flip, multiplied, simplified one and one eighth. Your letters would read something like this. Letter A, I subtracted, got $6.44. Letter B, I got $7.50. Letter C, I got 25. Letter D, it reduces to one half. Letter E, the square root of 121 is 11 plus 49 is 60. Divide by 10 gives me 5 times 7 gives me 35. How many different ways can the digits 5, 6, 7 and 5, 6 and 7 be arranged? There's three numbers guys, so 3 times 2 times 1. That's 6 permutations. We've had that a few times this year. 8 times 4 is 32 minus 2 is 30. Divide by 3 is 10. Times 4 is 40. Divide by 5 is 8 plus 1, 9 square root 3. Times 6, 18. Plus 2, 20 times 2, uh, 40, plus 2, 42, divided by 6, 7 times 5, 35, plus 1, 36, square root is 6. It says this, in the four class periods before lunch, Michael has math, English, science, and history, though not necessarily in that order. If each class is offered during each period, how many different permutations of the class were possible? So guys, I got four classes. I showed you this on the big diagram that we can work on to figure out sample space like we did in lesson 36. So for first hour he could either take math, science, history, or English, but we don't know which one. So if he chooses math, that means there's only three choices left for the next hour. He can only do science, history, or English. If he takes science out in hour two, that means he's only got two choices left. He can either do history or English. If he chooses history, that means there's only one choice left, it's English. And so you can see the diagram for just one period. Now guys, the easiest way to do that is it's just permutation. How many choices did I have? I had four choices for the first one. Then I have three choices for the next one. Then I have two choices for the last one. And I have one choice left. So all I'm doing easy is four times three times two times one. It goes right along with that letter you just had of how many different ways can we do five, six, and seven. Three times two times one, this is just one more step. So four times three is 12, times two is 24, times one is still 24. So your problem solving is 24. Don't waste your time trying to do a big diagram. I think that's more confusing. How many? And you just work your way down until you get there. All right, six, let's cruise in. Today we're gonna to learn about interpreting graphs. Um, interpreting graphs is just the great skill and ability to be able to work through the different things that we uh, get seen on, on different things. Remember yesterday we were talking area of a triangle, base times height, they have to be right angles or perpendicular, and then you cut it in half, guys, so divide by two. Remember, triangle is the only one where I'm dividing it by two. Then we start practicing complex area. In complex area, you got two choices. You can add the two pieces together, or you can figure out what the whole would be and then subtract the piece that they had chopped out of it. And you'll just learn, sometimes it's easier to do the subtraction based on the numbers they give you. Sometimes it's easier to do the addition based on the numbers they give you. With enough practice, you'll be able to see through that. Okay, in your yellow folder, right from the start, guys, you got a little blank to fill in. It says this, we use graphs to help us understand quantitative information. The root word is quantity, guys. Quantity is how much you have of something. A graph can use pictures, bars, lines, or parts of circles to help the reader visualize comparisons or changes. In this lesson, we'll simply practice interpreting those graphs. So hopefully you got your blank filled in. You got pictures, bars, or lines to be able to do those things. All right, the first example says, please refer to this pictograph below to answer the questions that follow. 
Adventure tire sales January, February, March. Adventure sold about how many tires in March? So I got March, I start counting one, two, three, four, five. They sold five and a half tires. The key to that, guys, is on the bottom that says a circle equals 100. So don't go so fast to go right to letter A and start reading the question without making sure you understand the graph. So it's not he sold five and a half tires, it sold 5.5 times 100. He sold 550 tires. B says about how many tires were sold in all months together. So I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 and a half. So he sold 1,550 tires as I add those three together. So you can see example one, looking at a graph, they made me add and multiply to get my answers. Example two, refer to the bar graph below to answer the questions that follow. About how many cans were collected by the students in room 14? So I get to room 14, I cruise up to the eight, I see that that's 8,000, they had about 8,000 cans. B says, the students in room 16 collected about as many cans as what other two rooms? So 16 got to about 9,000. My job was to figure out what two rooms added to get to 9,000. Well, that would be 5,000 plus 4,000. So I take room 12 and take room 18, put those together to get it. A great question that talks about comparison. Example three. This line graph shows Paul's bowling scores in the last six games he played. What was Paul's score for game three? So I'm at game three here, guys, and I'm going up here, and that's between, I forgot to write the numbers, between 170 and 180. So my job is to figure out what's halfway between 170 and 180. That would be 175. B, in general, were Paul's scores improving or getting worse? Improving, improving, worse, improving, improving. I said improving a lot more than worse. So in general, it's improving, guys. I know there was a time it got worse, but in general, it's improving. Example four. Use the information in this circle graph to answer the following questions. All together, how many hours are included in this graph? Well, I'm over here, guys. I just add. 4 plus 8 is 12, plus 12 is 24. Uh, I'm glad there's still 24 hours in a day, according to a math book, and just like in real life. Uh, they broke those things down to home and school and elsewhere. Back in the day when we used to be, I'd be able to be at school for eight hours. Uh, B says, what fraction of Aisha's day is spent at school? Well, she was there eight hours. Well, I told you the total was 24, so I have eight 24s. It needs to be reduced, guys. So there's a lot of questions you're getting on tests that are giving you numbers, and some of us are saying, what's the fraction? It's eight 24s. That's not correct. It's one third. You have to put it in those common terms now. We got through that lesson way back in like lesson 24, guys. We're in lesson 38. Everything needs to be reduced. Example five, which of these two graphs is constructed in a misleading way and what feature of the graph makes it misleading? This is the biggest thing I need to stress to you about graphs, guys. Both of those graphs are saying the exact same information. If I look on the left and the right, they both give you about 25 inches for 23 for 2003. They both give you a little over 30 for 2004. They both give you a little over 20 for 2005. And they both give you about 20 for 2006. They're showing you the exact same information, but one's misleading. And that would be misleading like this. In which year did, in 2004, did we get twice as much rain as 2006? If you looked at the right graph, guys, you would say, yeah, 2004, look at that. It's more than double what it was in 2006. That's not true, guys. 20 is not double the 32 or 31. Okay, so when you look at these graphs, guys, I drew them out here. These look like they're all kind of close. This looks like, my goodness, there's way more rain than it is here. Now, what's the feature? It's this little, little broken scale thing they did. They didn't start at zero, guys. They started with their first line at 20. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, guys. In fact, if you look at example three, that's exactly what they did in example three. They put that little break in there to say we jumped from zero all the way up to our first score of 160 because there wasn't anything lower than that. So you can do that. It's not like you're lying. It's just a little misleading. And so sometimes I would show misleading graphs because I want to make a point and say, Look at what happened to the rainfall. We are just not getting nearly enough rain. And people look at it and go, yeah, he's right. Look at that, the rain's getting cut in half. Nah, I misled you, didn't I? 
we would look here and say it's going down, but it's not that bad. So guys, keep your eyes open for misleading charts. We, do, we tragically do it all the time in America. Uh, politics is one of the greatest examples we do with misleading information. And it's, it's not a lie, guys. It's just misleading the way we choose it because I want to make it sound or show my point in a certain way. So look out for that. Example six says, which of these two graphs is better to display Todd's height from an age? So you got the bar graph, you got the line graph. As I'm talking change over time, guys, we always use a line graph. This shows that he is every day changing his height. It's not this year, ding, all of a sudden, ooh, it's the next year, grow an inch. It's the next year, grow an inch. This makes it look like it's choppy. This makes it look like it's going continuous. And so guys, all they're stressing with that one is when I'm talking about a change over time, I want a line graph. Bar graphs, good for comparing. Pictographs, um, you have those things. Um, obviously we can do all kinds of things with these graphs guys but just that's what they're getting at for example little six okay you got a few examples there uh, the bottom page if you want to work on those things just make sure you take in the title make sure you take in both axes on what they're telling you on the on the vertical and the horizontal and then like this first one guys make sure you catch those things so that you give the right answer not 5.5 but 550 all right see you for uh, questions Six right here we get going on lesson 38. Number one says, the ratio of walkers to joggers was three to seven. What was the fraction of athletes at the track were walkers? So I gotta take my three to seven and I gotta add them together. They consider that 10 athletes. Now they ask me how many were walkers. That's that first number. So it's three tenths. I'm just gonna write it as a fraction because uh, that's what they asked me to do. Number two, Denise read 345 pages book in one, three days. What was her average number? So I got a total of 345. I divide it by the three days, goes in there once, subtract zero, bring down four, goes in once, three, subtract, bring one, bring down the 15, goes in there five. She averaged 115 pages each day. Number five, if Paul scored 185 in game seven from example three, what will be his average score of all seven games? Well, in game seven here, he scored a 185. Now I gotta go back in my book to example three, and I see in game one, he scored a 160. I see in game two, he scored a 170. I see in game three, he scored a 175. In game four, he's back to 170. In game five, he was up to 180. And in game six, he was up to 185. And I already wrote the game seven up top. So I got five, five, five is 15. Carry the one. One plus eight is nine, 15. 22, 29, 36, 44, 52. Carry the five. One, two, three, five, six, seven plus five is 12. Now I take that 12 and I divide it by seven. Goes in there one time, subtract 52. Goes in there seven times is 49, subtract is three, bring down that five, goes in there five times. And I got an average score of 175, which makes me feel real good that it came out nice and even and increases my confidence that I did it right. Number eight says, refer to the figure at the right to answer A and B. Dimensions are in inches, all angles are right angles. What is the area of the hexagon? Okay, guys, so you got this complex shape here. And you, they gave you 20, and they gave you 18, they gave you 12, and they gave you 6. I'm going to look at the horizontal 1 and horizontal 2. I add them together, that gives me 30. I look at vertical 1 and vertical 2, I subtract those, that gave me 14. Okay, now you got two choices. You can decide what's there or what's missing. I'm going to go like this. I'm going to drop this thing and cut it here. When I cut it here, guys, I circle that 30. See how I went through the 30? I don't want to use the 30 because I'm chopping the 30 into two pieces. So I'm going to use these two, and I'm going to use these two. So I know that 6 times 12 is 72, and I know that 20 times 18 is 360. I now take 360 plus 72. I add them together to get my two total pieces. And I get an answer of 432. 
We are working with inches and its area, so it's inches squared. B said, what's the perimeter? I have total length, 30. I have total width, 20. 30 plus 20 added together is 50 times 2 is 100 inches. The shortcut when you have a rectangular shape like that. Add together and you got 100 inches. Great practice, guys. We're going to get those a lot. Number 9 says complete each equivalent fractions. They gave me 7 ninths and something to 18. 18. I multiply by 2 on the bottom, multiply by 2 on the top, gives me 14. Next one is I don't know over 9 gives me 20 over 36. This was by the power of 4 here, and I'm going backwards, so we're really dividing. So I'll make that to 5 ninths. Last one they gave me is 4 fifths up to 24. That would be a times 6. So I times 6 on the bottom would give me 30. 24 over 30. Turn the page of my book, number 11. The face of this spinner is divided into eight congruent sectors. The spinner is spun once. On which number is it most likely to stop? So guys, I just look at those things and see that there are three number ones. So it's most likely to stop on the number one. B, on which number is it least likely to stop? Well, there's three ones, there's two twos, there's two threes, and there's one four. So least likely is the number four. C, which is the better sample space for this experiment and say why? Sample space one, which gives you one, two, three, four, or sample space two, which gives you one, 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 two, two, three, three, and four? The correct answer, guys, is it's sample, I'm gonna call them SS, sample space two, because that lists all possibilities. The problem with sample space one, guys, is it looks like you have the equal amount to get a one, a two, a three, or a four. That's not true. So you want to make sure you do sample space two, which lists all the possibilities. Number 13 says find the perimeter of the rectangle in centimeters. They gave it to you in one centimeter, and this one's over here in millimeters. Centimeters to millimeters is divide by 10. Boom, so I divide by 10. I add 1 to 1.2. That gives me 2.2. I then double it because it's a rectangle. Gives me 4.4 centimeters. So making sure we don't go too fast, guys, and you see that one's in centimeters and one's in millimeters. Number 15. It says, in the figure below, diagonal AC divides quadrilateral ABCD into two congruent triangles. You will use those to help you with number 15. Which segment is perpendicular to AD? So I have this drawing going like this. And then they chop it with this right angle. So they gave me AD. What's perpendicular to it? This one's perpendicular to it. That's letter A to C. So my answer for A is AC. Which segment appears to be parallel to AD? This is parallel to this one over here. This gives me a B. So it's BC. Flipping my answer key over. Number 16 continues to work on it. It says, the perpendicular sides of ACD are 6 each. So ACD, this is a 6 and this is a 6. So it says, what's the area of it? Well, guys, that's a triangle. So 6 times 6 is 36. I need to cut it in half is 18. So you are 18 centimeters squared. B says, what's the area of the other one? Well, guys, it said we're doing congruent triangles. So if it's 18 down here, then it's 18 up here. So A is 18, B is also 18. C says, what's the area when I put them together? That's back to the 36, guys. Okay, so 18 centimeters squared for A, 18 centimeters squared for B, 36 centimeters squared uh, for C. That's teaching you area of a parallelogram, guys, is base times height. <coughs> Ooh, sorry about the sneeze. Number 18. Uh, M minus 3.6 equals 4.7. I'm missing the first. I add. Now it's just a matter of lining those things up, adding them together. Gives you 8.3. First you add, second you subtract. Keep those straight. Number 20. Missing the dividend, I multiply. So I know 25 times 25 is 625. It's a perfect square. Now I count my decimal places. One, two, one, two. So my answer is 6.25. 22. I am learning to divide. Inside the box, outside the box, 
Decimal straight up, 5 goes into 1, 0, 5 goes into 12 twice, multiplied is 10, subtracted is 2, brought down the 5, divide is 5, that's 25, and I'm done, 25 hundredths. 23, we got a multiplication problem of 5 ninths times 6, put it over 1 so I can work it, make it improper, 2 times 10 is 20, plus 1 is 21 over 10. Now I start to cancel. Divide by 5 is 1. Divide by 5 is 2. Divide by 3 is 2. Divide by 3 is 3. Divide by 2 is 2 um, is 1. Divide by 2 is 1. Divide by 3 is 1. Divide by 3 is 7. On the top, I have 7. On the bottom, I have 1. Everything over 1 is that number, so my answer is 7. 26. Parentheses says do it first, so the first thing is 1 half minus 1 fifth. Common denominators would be 10 times 5 over 5 here to give me 5 tenths times 2 over 2 here gives me 2 tenths. I am subtracting that gives me 3 tenths. I'm now taking 3 tenths and subtracting 3 tenths from it. Well, that equals 0. And last, 28. It says, how many milliliters of liquid are in this container? Now, guys, that's just reading. You have a thing that looks like this. This would be bottom, ding, ding. Then they give you 100. Then this, this, this. And then they give you the next line, and they say this is 200. And my water level is about there. So 0, 25, I'm sorry, bottom of your glass. 25, 50, 75, 100. 25, 50, 75, 100. I'm going up by 25, so this would be 125 milliliters. It says the amount of liquid in this container is how much less than a liter? Well, a liter, guys, is 1,000 milliliters. I'm subtracting it, what I have here, which is 125. Cross that out as a 9. Cross it out as a 9. Got 10. That's 5, 7, 8. 875 milliliters. Make sure we're